Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Ada, and I'm an MBPhD student at the University of Cambridge. At the heart of what we do is to bring a condition from the bedside to the bench, and then translate our findings back to the patient. And so today, I'm delighted to be here to bring you through the journey of three patients who presented in a very similar manner nearly 10 years apart which led to the discovery of this group of mutations and the elucidation of the mechanisms that underlie their condition. So just a bit of background on the field that I'm working in. Primary aldosteronism is the most common cause of secondary hypertension. It is due to excessive aldosterone secretion from the adrenal, either due to hyperplasia or due to a tumour as first described by Dr. Jerome Korn 60 years ago. This syndrome complex also includes suppressed renin, and this excess aldosterone acts mainly on the kidneys to cause sodium reabsorption, net fluid retention, and hence, consequently, high blood pressure. Even though these tumours secrete aldosterone, curiously, up to recently, the predominant subtype of aldosterone-producing adenomas are these large, 3 centimetre ones that consist of cells that paradoxically resemble the cortisol-secreting zone of the adrenal. We call these zona fasciculata-like or ZF-like adenomas. What we have been noticing more recently are this second type of smaller sub-centimetre tumours which are very much lipid depleted and look distinctly different from the above subgroup. Due to their small size, this second group of zona glomerulosa-like or ZG-like adenomas tend to be underdiagnosed. Now, thanks to a landmark paper in Science in 2011, we now know that this first subgroup of larger ZF-like adenomas have causative somatic mutations in a potassium channel KCNJ5. So this brings us to the question of whether the smaller ZG-like tumours have their own hallmark mutations. Because up to recently, it wasn't appreciated that this condition in fact comes in different flavours. So this led our group to exome sequence 10 of these smaller ZG-like adenomas. And very excitingly, 9 out of the 10, in fact, were found to have somatic mutations in either a sodium-potassium ATPase or voltage-gated calcium channel. So my question is, how about tumour number 10? I was very curious because not only was tumour 10 the only tumour which didn't have any of these above-mentioned mutations, it was also the most ZG-like in the cohort. So I looked back at our records to see who this tumour belonged to. It belonged to our patient PN, a 34-year-old female who presented when she was 17 weeks pregnant with hypertension and edema. At presentation, she was hypokalemic with suppressed renin and highly elevated aldosterone levels. Now, before I leave this slide, it is perhaps interesting to note that postpartum, even though her potassium had been corrected, which should lead to an increase in aldosterone, however, her aldosterone levels were less than half of what they were during pregnancy. And so a diagnosis of Kohn syndrome was made, and CT reviewed an adenoma in the right adrenal gland. This was confirmed by adrenal vein sampling to be the culprit, and she then went on to have an adrenalectomy. Post-adrenalectomy, her blood pressure went down to just 105.68, and her electrolytes were corrected. Perhaps most dramatically was the fall in her aldosterone levels from over 1,000 postpartum to now just 172 picomoles per litre after the surgery. Surgery reviewed a well-circumscribed nodule, 1.4 centimetres in diameter, and histologically, this tumour had cells that resemble the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal, being very much lipid depleted and having these characteristic spironolectone bodies. We have recently come to recognise these spironolectone bodies as categorical markers of this subtype, the second subtype of smaller ZG-like adenomas. And so, even though our tumour number 10 didn't have any of the above-mentioned mutations, we then found that it had a mutation of its own in the beta-catenin gene, and this is frequently mutated in adrenal carcinoma. Due to the circumstances under which our patient PN presented, we then asked the question, could this pregnancy unmasked primary aldosteronism be a clinical phenotype of these beta-catenin-mutated tumours? And this was because we subsequently encountered two more tumours that showed such pure Z-genus. One of them, patient two, presenting also in pregnancy, 
the third one presenting at menopause. Upon sequencing, all three patients had tumours that were found to have different mutations, but in the same exon of the same gene that encodes beta-catenin, which is a key player in the wind signalling pathway. This itself is key to cell differentiation, and its relevance you will soon see. So the question is, what do these three mutations have in common? And that is, they are functionally active in the same way. The wind signalling pathway is commonly measured by quantifying the activity of a downstream transcription factor, TCF-LEF. So using such a reporter assay, we have shown that the three mutations in fact cause increased transcriptional activity compared to the wild-type beta-catenin or the vector control. In addition to that, Western blotting has revealed that active beta-catenin expression was also increased if you look at the top row here, in the three mutants compared to GAP-DH as the loading control. And this is because the three mutations, in fact, they affect the phosphorylation of beta-catenin and hence prevents its degradation. The lack of degradation means an abnormal accumulation of beta-catenin and hence aberrant wind activation. Now that I've hopefully convinced you that these mutations are indeed functional, let me address the link to pregnancy. Now, by a second stroke of luck, not only was our patient PN involved in an exome sequencing, she was also in a microarray that we conducted. So in this graph here, with the y-axis in a log 2 scale, we can see that this difference, in fact, represents an over 700-fold increase in the expression of a gene, LHCGR, or luteinizing hormone choreogonadotropin receptor, in the tumour of our patient PN compared to other histologically similar ZG-like adenomas or other ZF-like adenomas. Another gene in which our patient PN had over 120-fold increase in expression was that encoding the gonadotropin-releasing hormone receptor. So all in all, our patient PN had a tumour that expressed high levels of both of these pregnancy-related receptors. This turns out to be functionally relevant because both of these receptors are coupled to adenylyl cyclase and activate aldosterone production. These microarray findings were subsequently validated by quantitative polymerase chain reaction in all three patients. But perhaps most strikingly was when we conducted immunohistochemistry to stain for the RHCGR protein. As you can see here in our patient PN, the tumour of our patient PN had abundant membrane staining of our RHCGR compared to the adjacent normal adrenal from the same patient. And this was, through, this was true for all three of our patients. So up till now, we have strictly only been able to show an association between having the mutation and having an increased expression of this receptor on your tumor surface. So I then went one step further and transfected primary adrenal cells with the beta-catenin mutant. So what you see here at the top left corner, we have individual cells delineated by the blue DAPI nuclear stain. And as you can see, only successfully transfected cells shown here in green for GFP stain positively for LHCGR. The two top right-hand corner cells here that are untransfected do not stain or express LHCGR. So why is it that having this mutation seems to cause adrenal cells to aberrantly express gonadal receptors? We believe that this molecular link hinges upon the fact that the adrenal cortex and the gonads stem from a common progenital cell population in the urogenital ridge. This population then diverges in development into either adrenal cortex primordium or gonadal primordium, and that is tightly regulated by the wind signaling cascade of which beta-catenin is a pivotal player. And so we think that some adrenal cells acquire this beta-catenin mutation and then go on to undergo wind activation and gonadal differentiation, expressing aberrant receptors that normally are found only in gonadal cells. So in conclusion, our patient presenting relatively unusually in early pregnancy led us to consider pregnancy unmasked primary aldosteronism, and the discovery of beta-catenin mutations was made by studying all three tumours, and we drew a molecular link based on the shared progenitor origins of the adrenal cortex and the gonads. The wider implications of this work is that it is clinically important for clinicians to recognize primary aldosteronism when faced with similar presentations. And finally, 
What troubles us most in clinic is the ability to predict which group of patients are completely cured by adrenalectomy and which group still remains on medication. So we think that because all three of our patients responded tremendously well to adrenalectomy, and in light of this morning's lecture by Nick Zen, that there may be the potential of genotyping that may come in over here. So 60 years after Dr. Kohn discovered the first aldosterone-producing adenoma, we now have found a distinct novel subset of an old syndrome. So perhaps 60 years ago, the adenoma that was found was just the tip of a giant iceberg. With that, I'd like to thank the following people and my funding bodies without whom this research would not be possible. Thank you. <laughs>